Good evening. As Chairman of the Hartford Board of Education, I hereby call to order the April 16, 2019 special meeting. I wish to extend a warm welcome to everyone present and to our television viewers. The board, superintendent, and I are pleased that you have joined us as we celebrate achievement, review information, and make policy decisions related to the effective operation of the Hartford Public Schools. This is a special meeting on our recommended budget, and all items that will be discussed or voted on this evening have been posted as required by state law. As the Hartford Board of Education, we are here to set goals, listen to reports of the superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, and personnel appointments, and make policy for the district. We are not here to make management decisions or solve the problems of individuals. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent. The monthly meetings of the board are open to the public. They are the time when the board conducts its business of governing the school system in a public arena. The regular meetings are not meetings with the public. Therefore, comments from the audience will be confined to the time designated for the public to address the board. Decorum and court courtesy are important elements in effective public meetings. Please silence your cell phones or communication devices and refrain from talking while others are speaking. Since it is legally mandated that proceedings be accurately recorded, I may have to ask for order periodically should noise begin to interfere with our recording capabilities. I am pleased that you have taken the time this evening to join us. We are very proud of the school system and thank you for your interest in the Hartford Public Schools. And now I will read it in Spanish. Buenas noches. Como Presidente de la Junta de Educación de Hartford, he llamado a orden esta reunión especial de la Junta del 16 de abril de 2019. Damos una cálida bienvenida a todas las personas presentes y a nuestros televidentes. La Junta y la superintendente se complacen que se han unido a nosotros para celebrar logros, revisar información y tomar decisiones relacionadas con el funcionamiento efectivo de las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Esta es una reunión ordinaria, eh, perdón, es una reunión especial. Todos los asuntos que serán discutidos o votados en esta tarde han sido notificados como lo requiere la ley estatal. Como Junta de Educación de Hartford, estamos aquí para establecer metas, escuchar los informes de la superintendente, aprobar los presupuestos, contratos y nombramientos de personal y establecer normas para el distrito. No estamos aquí para tomar decisiones administrativas o resolver problemas individuales. La administración es la responsabilidad de la superintendente. Las reuniones mensuales de la Junta están abiertas al público. Son el momento en que la Junta lleva a cabo su tarea de gobernar el sistema escolar en un espacio público. Las reuniones regulares no son reuniones con el público. Por lo tanto, los comentarios de la audiencia se limitarán al tiempo designado para el público dirigirse a la Junta. El decoro y la cortesía son elementos importantes en reuniones públicas eficaces. Por favor, silencie sus teléfonos celulares o dispositivos de comunicación y absténganse de hablar mientras otros están hablando, ya que es mandato de legal de que los procedimientos sean grabados con precisión, es posible que tengamos que pedir orden periódicamente si el ruido interfiere con nuestras capacidades de grabación. Nos complace que se haya tomado el tiempo esta tarde para unirse a nosotros. Estamos muy orgullosos de este sistema escolar. Le damos gracias por su interés en las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Eh, si alguna persona necesita traducción al español, el Doctor Vázquez Matos le va a ayudar con el servicio. El doctor Vázquez Matos está allí de pie. Gracias. We as a board, in collaboration with the superintendent and district leadership, are committed to cultivating a culture of excellence at all levels of HBS. We thank you for taking the time to attend tonight's board meeting. We appreciate you coming out to learn more about Hartford Public Schools and for sharing your thoughts and concerns. We have established a protocol to track and respond to concerns raised. We want you to know that we take your concerns seriously and to that end, we will have staff available for immediate follow-up if follow-up is required. After you have finished speaking, a staff member will come up to you ready to take your information down. They will follow up with an update within 48 hours. As a reminder, you have three minutes to speak 
And at the two minute mark, Ms. Santiago will ring the bell, letting you know you have one minute left. At the second bell, please wrap up your comments. Now, Chairman Flores will read this in Spanish. Nosotros, la Junta de Educación, en colaboración con la Superintendente y Personal del Distrito, estamos comprometidos a cultivar una escultura de excelencia en todos los niveles de las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Les agradecemos que haya tomado el tiempo para asistir a la reunión de la Junta esta noche. Les agradecemos su participación y su deseo de aprender más sobre las escuelas públicas de Hartford, y también por compartir sus pensamientos y preocupaciones. Nosotros tomamos sus preocupaciones muy seriamente y hemos establecido un protocolo para el seguimiento y respuesta a inquietudes planteadas. Tenemos personal disponible para seguimiento inmediato para los casos que lo requieren. Una vez que usted haya terminado de hablar, un miembro del personal estará disponible para tomar su información. Esa persona investigará su caso y se comunicará con usted dentro de 48 horas. Le recordamos que tienen tres minutos para hablar. Cuando hayan pasado dos minutos, la señorita Santiago sonará el timbre, dejándole saber que le queda un minuto. Al segundo sonido, por favor, termine sus comentarios. Andrea Johnson. Good evening. Good evening, Superintendent and Board of Education members. In the past school year, the Hartford Federation of Teachers has been speaking with the Superintendent of Schools regarding the difficulties within many Hartford schools concerning the climate and culture within those schools. Most troublesome is student discipline. In too many cases within the schools, students are not being held accountable for behavior that is totally unacceptable. In too many schools, disrespectful language, actions, and lack of accountability behavior, acceptable behavior are commonplace. As one teacher stated to me, between 20 and 40 students are out of class during instructional time in their particular school. When the teacher asked why the students are not in class, this is what they get for an answer. Go F yourself. This is common language used towards adults constantly. Students at this school are literally walking the halls and creating not only an unsafe environment, but of course not receiving instruction. Are these consequences for the are there consequences for these students? No. Students are not given consequences when this kind of behavior just mentioned occurs. It seems that anything goes in some of our schools. It also seems the policies that this Board of Education passed, as an example, school uniforms, does not exist at one of the high schools. When a teacher at Hartford Public High School asked a student why they were not in uniform, this was done in front of the principal. The teacher was reprimanded and asked for asking the student that question. Teachers have been injured by students who have bit, kicked, scratched, and thrown objects at the educators. There is little to no discipline given to these students. Of course, you all realize when no consequences are given for wrongdoing, that wrongdoing becomes all right in the eye of the person or persons committing the offense. Of course, it is not acceptable, but without consequences for poor behavior, poor behavior becomes the norm. Board members, do these examples sound like a practice the Hartford Board of Education would accept? This evening, you will hear from a variety of Harvard Federation of Teacher members who will be giving you more information about unacceptable behavior within our schools. Please remember that we are teachers whose jobs entail educating our students, but along with the book learning, there absolutely must be skills, life skills. 
life skills learning, meaning respect for one another, which includes respectful language being used and consequences to those who choose to break the rules. I ask the Board of Education members, please, please walk through some of our schools. We'd be happy to tell you which ones. Sometime in the next several weeks, unannounced. These words are from the state statute, the Harvard of the Connecticut state law. It says education is to keep the children safe and to teach the students. When what I have just described is going on in the schools, safety is not happening. That is number one before education. Safety, then education. Please hear this. Thank you. Heather Zatola. Good evening, Superintendent Torres Rodriguez and board members. My name is Heather Zatola, and I have been a proud Hartford educator for almost 27 years. I am also a proud parent of two children who both attended Hartford schools for the past 11 years, and one is still a student here at HMTCA. Despite being in Hartford for 27 years, I have never spoken at a Board of Education meeting. I feel the need to speak today to represent the many frustrated and distraught teachers that I work with on a daily basis. <clears throat> I'm not here to speak poorly about my administrators, as I know they have been as supportive as they can be. Assuming that many of you may not have classroom experience, I thought I would give you a glimpse into a teacher's day. We all got into this professional profession for varying reasons, but one thing is for sure, we all love children and we want to teach. Unfortunately, some days that is the last thing we feel we've been able to do. On any given day, a teacher may tell a student who's on the learning rug that what they just said to another student wasn't nice, and that student may turn to his teacher and call her trash. He may then get up and go tear up his reading book, all simply because you spoke to him about inappropriate behavior. A pre-K student may not like that he was told no, and he may bite, kick, hit, scratch, or spit on his teacher, leaving marks. And those are pre-Ks. In the aftermath of the OCA report, teachers have become targets and have fallen victim to false student accusations. One student even went so far as to fall out of his chair in class and proclaim that the teacher pushed him. Another student backed up his story in writing, despite the student who had fallen confessing to administration that he had made that all up. We're scared. Students are also free to tear up our rooms in a rage, and we have to sit back and watch it all happen. We're told to evacuate our classroom, but keep an eye on that raging student. Oh yes, and keep pace with the district's EL and, Eure and Eureka math pacing guides. We're tired. Some teachers also deal with unreasonable parents who think it's acceptable to poison pen them over email, or worse, enter our building and physically and verbally assault them. We don't feel safe. When my colleague, who has only been teaching for five years and who was also my student teacher and an exemplary one at that, cries almost daily because of the behaviors in our classroom and our team has an almost daily discussion about what other career paths we can take using our current educational degrees, you know things are bad. When a 27-year veteran can't remember ever being this frustrated with her job, you know things are bad. In my opinion, students have changed over the 27 years. Some have become less teachable, less willing to listen, less motivated to work, much less respectful of authority, and have shorter attention spans. They have no fear of consequences because, frankly, there are none. And so here we stand trying to force common core standards down the throats of the disinterested. And don't get me wrong, every day we come to work, sometimes reluctantly, and attempt to do our job, but we're asking for help. We're asking for more resources for our students who may be traumatized and need something more than a classroom teacher can give them, especially when you have a class of 20 some odd students to deal with as well. And if we don't get more support for these students, I'm not sure how long many of us can last. Thank you for your time. Thank you. William Morrison. Thank you. 
William Morrison, Beth Basher, Good evening. My name is Beth Bashir, and I have been a teacher in Hartford for 35 years. I have taught everything from first grade through high school. I am here this evening to plead with you to make the social and emotional health of our students a priority. I could do the same stories as the previous speaker just said with teachers that are called names, vulgar names, told to F off every day, are sworn at, students, other students are teased and intimidated, students walk out of class, students when they're told they're going to be written up, basically say, I don't give up, whatever, because nothing's going to happen anyway. They are very empowered and do not feel any type of consequence. So one of the things we had talked about was maybe having some solutions. When I was a middle school teacher at Naylor, we had a social worker, a guidance counselor, a school psychologist, a health teacher, and a vice principal for the seventh and eighth grade teachers. These staff members were able to support the classroom teachers and address the emotional and behavioral needs of our students. We also had an active peer mediation program that involved a group of students trained to mediate conflicts between students with teacher support. Naylor one time had a marriage and family intern program through Central Connecticut State University that also provided additional support for our students. We had mentorship programs with the CCSU college students who came in to spend time with our students, our most socially challenged students, to give them the one-on-one -on -one attention that they needed. We have almost none of this support anymore. We have two social workers and a part-time psychologist for 565 students. We have a behavior tech who is often occupied with one or two students across all grade levels, pre-K through eight, and also has duties such as cafeteria duty. You might ask, why don't we have these programs anymore? It is much due to the lack of staff and the time demand on teachers and administrators to constantly implement new academic programs, attend meetings, prepare testing, and much more. Providing and developing support programs takes time that we do not have, especially when it is not, does not seem to be a priority of our school system. There needs to be leadership and the philosophy that it is just as important to help our students learn to be good citizens as it is to develop their academic skills. We hold a high bar of expectations for what our students should be able to accomplish academically. Why do we not hold the same high bar for how our students should conduct themselves behaviorally in a public school setting? We do our students an injustice when we do not believe that they can do better. The board and the administration need to back all schools, students, and staff in leading the way to provide the support that is needed to make all of our schools places where all understand that we have a moral obligation to support the decorum necessary to truly enhance learning. Thank you. Kim Webster. Hello, I am at Classical Magnet and I was a chemist and with both those jobs I was in the military. So I have a lot of life experience. In Hartford we have heard that we practice restorative justice in PBIS. I do not deny that knowing why a student acts out or how to help that student make better choices is important. I, however, do not believe that as a district we are meeting the needs of these students, the ones that act out. If the district wants to implement restorative justice in PBS, then they need to properly train those within the schools to do this. I have never been trained on either of these. I would love to be properly trained so they can help those students become the best version of themselves. There's more to restorative justice in PBS than incentives. 
there are meaningful consequences for students' actions. Without the meaningful consequences for their actions, what will help them make a better choice? If all that happens is a conversation time and time again, then when does their behavior change? What does this demonstrate to our students? That acting out is okay? Disrupting the teaching and learning of our students matter more than the teaching and learning if their actions go unanswered. I'm here today to give a voice to those students who are feeling the frustration with the lack of coherent discipline within our schools. These students are the ones that suffer the most when their classmates act out and steal, yes, steal their education. They lose valuable time within the classroom that is already limited. These students are also undervalued and they feel that way. All the attention is given to those students who are acting out, not just once in a while, but regularly. There are students who seek out their teachers to do more within the classroom, understand concepts at a deeper level. Yes, they care about their grades, but they want to learn and they work hard every day. I see the frustration in their faces and in their speech. They, like me, do not understand how a group of students can hold their education hostage. There are students who come to get help every morning and every intervention session, not because they need the help, but rather want the help or just want a safe place to work. There are also students within, within HPS that leave and go to CREC, perhaps due to this very reason, having their education held hostage for those few who act out. There are times when a student does receive a meaningful consequence and a parent calls either the school or central office to negotiate the consequence. This helps to reinforce that this behavior is acceptable. How can someone not within the school where the incident occurred do not have the necessary information to make an informed decision? Hands are being tied from the top down concerning discipline. Does not help any students. Those that act out now know they can negotiate out or reduce their consequences and those students that learn beside these students see that acting out is okay, which they make themselves also act out. I implore you to keep these hardworking students in mind. They are the true victims of the lack of coherent discipline within our school. They lose valuable time they will never get back. We're not doing our best to make an environment that they feel safe and valued. This is the first time that many people, both staff and students, do not feel safe in our schools in this district. Thank you. Uh, before the next speaker comes up, I'd just like to make a brief comment that uh, we appreciate your comments and we want to hear them. I know these are things that are important to you, but we have a lot of speakers this evening. I don't want to interrupt anyone, but I would appreciate it if uh, people can speed up and, and, and try to stay within the allotted time. Thank you. Okay. Eileen Flattery. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that note before my speech. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Eileen Flaherty. I've been a uh, teacher in Hartford for 15 years, and uh, all of those have been at Hartford Magnet Trinity College Academy. I'd like to turn our attention to our district model for excellence, which you all know declares the following. We believe in our beautiful and capable students, high expectations, inclusiveness, collaboration, continuous improvement, and systemic accountability. Those are honorable beliefs, shared hopefully by all present, but believing is not enough. It's time to act collaboratively on those shared beliefs. It is time to set high expectations for our beautiful and capable students, and high expectations include appropriate behavior. It is time to commit to the continuous improvement of our beautiful and capable students, and improvement includes appropriate behavior. It is time to demand accountability from our beautiful and capable students. Accountability includes appropriate behavior. 
We proclaim that our mission is, quote, to inspire and prepare all students to meet success in and beyond school. In order to meet that success, our students must develop both academically and behaviorally. As Dr. King noted, intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. We have to address the serious behavioral issues in our schools. We owe our children a true education, intelligence plus character. Thank you. <laughs> Tiffany Moyer, Washington. Hi. Um, I speak before you as a teacher, although I am a parent of four Harvard Public School students. Um, I speak as a parent. I mean, I speak as a teacher today, sorry, not as a parent. Um, I have been teaching in Hartford for 15 years. I've been at neighborhood schools and at magnet schools. And in the last few years, we have made a transition philosophically to this kind of restorative approach. However, I think we're missing major elements of it. I'm not pro-punishment, but I'm pro-consequence. I feel like what's happened in this kind of long transition is we've gone from taking students who we were suspending left and right for all kinds of offenses to the opposite end of not suspending at all. I'm not saying I'm pro-suspension at all. I'm pro-consequence. One of my colleagues got up here and said that they talked about a student going and having a conversation, but not changing their behavior. We need to hold students responsible and accountable for their behavior. So my daughter's in kindergarten. This year, she got a negative report home. She was sitting with her classmates, and she broke a bunch of crayons at a table. Uh, and so she came home. We talked to her about it. She used her allowance money. We went to the dollar store. She bought some crayons. She brought them into her teacher to apologize for breaking the crayons that belonged to the cat class. That was a consequence that we implemented as parents. This would be an example of restorative practice that could happen on the school level. However, teachers are not being trained. Administrators don't nearly have enough time to provide things like that. So what's happening? as students are running to an office, complaining about a teacher, swearing at somebody, so forth, being told to go back to class without any opportunity to repair the damage that they've created or repair the relationships that's been damaged. Um, a friend of mine, Dan Dusing, asked if I could share some results of an informal poll he put up uh, with a number of teachers. And 94 different Hartford teachers have said that they feel that learning of all students is negatively impacted by certain student behaviors. 74 teachers said that most teachers believe support staff would improve a learning environment. 53 said that most believe student behavior has declined in the past three years. And only 32 have had restorative practice implemented at their schools. I think when you look at all these things, if we say we're going to be a restorative district, we need to follow up with the support for the schools, for the teachers, for the practice. Our district model for excellence says that we ensure all students feel safe and valued. I think it's impossible to have a district where that happens when adults are being spat at, sworn at, things are thrown at them, when they're supposed to be the teacher protecting the rest of the students in the class. I don't think that we've had a proper trauma-informed teaching practices at all, and I don't think we have practiced this restorative practice. I think all of these things cost money that has not been implemented. We have professional development multiple times throughout the year. It'd be a great place to start to teach trauma-informed practices and restorative practices. Thank you. Ray Yakko. Good evening, board members and HFT members, teachers and families. Uh, thanks for seeing me tonight. Uh, I've been a teacher in the Hartford school system for 30 years. I started at Weaver High School, probably one of the greatest schools I've ever worked at. I'll be honest with you, it really was. We had, we, left, uh, we had to leave uh, 11 years ago when uh, Mr. Adamowski uh, started the magnet schools. Uh, I'm a healthcare worker for many years as well, so I was, was instrumental in getting the nursing academy started, something that we wanted our kids to do. We're kind of surprised at what's happened in this Hartford school system. 
Um, discipline at my school, Hartford Public High School, has become almost non-existent. I'd like to say non-existent because I really don't see much about it, but it has become a really almost non-existent situation. Our children roam the halls. Now, this is a tough thing to say because good kids, when they see bad kids doing this kind of stuff and nothing happens to them, will emulate that. I hate to say it, you know, they, you know, if they can get away with something, they would probably do that. And, uh, and our kids who roam the halls will do it, and they'll be shouting profanity at, down the halls, and our administrative team seems to have very little effect on them. As a matter of fact, my, off, my classroom is located next to the main office. I rarely see the administrative team come out of their office. There are 160 different members who work at Hartford Public High School, yet they want the 93 teachers to be the only ones to manage the kids who are in the halls as well as the ones who are in their classroom. It doesn't make sense. Um, it's, it's a terrible situation. The kids are wonderful. I love teaching chemistry to the kids. The kids do a great job when they're there. But all this discipline stuff coupled with what we now call block scheduling, which is a real mess, okay, uh, boy, we, we end up with kids who just don't seem to get it. The teachers are upset. Uh, uh, the discipline issues don't seem to get handled. I file referral forms on kids who cut classes or do something. I ne haven't get received, I may have gotten one or two responses all year long back from the administrative team. They don't follow the process. You know, earlier this school year, we, uh, we did away with the discipline forms, if you guys remember. And it used to be a quadruple form where one page was given to the discipline committee. It was a good checks and balances thing. It was not to get anybody. It was just a good checks and balances. And also for somebody else to keep an eye on what the discipline was like in our schools. You know, we at Weaver High School, we had our issues also, but we dealt with them. I don't see these issues being dealt with at Hartford Public High School. And the real sad part about it is, is that our attendance rate has just become awful. I think 67% of our kids are, are absent almost on a daily basis from one class or another. I don't know the exact statistic, but it's extremely high. I, uh, I just can't get over that, that so many kids would be allowed not to go to school, to not be in class, to walk the halls, and to just be chronic problems over and over again. Everybody, everything that everybody else said about restorative justice is absolutely true. Everything that they said about these situations about being sworn at, spit at, hit at, whatever you want to call it, is absolutely true. At the high school level, it's really tough because now they're bigger than we are. And we had a security guard get stomped in this, this past October. Much of that situation is still potential. We, we all feel it under the surface of the skin of, at, at Hartford Public High School. Now, I don't want to complain about Hartford Public High School because it's not going to exist too much longer. We just got news today that we're being reconstituted, which means that 100% of those teachers who work there will have to reapply for their job, but that none of the administrative team will have to concern themselves with that. We see the problem as a top-down problem. Okay, so your time is up. Oh, I thought that was my two-minute time. Oh, well, thank you for your time. Ron Linker. I'm Ron Linker, how are you? Dose dice at decide. It's written in stone on the front of the second oldest school in the United States of America. Dose dice at decide. Written in stone. That used to mean something. You say, they say you can't rock the pub. Have you visited the pub lately? It's been rocked. Numerous students regularly and loudly wander the hallways. The same students who cause extreme disruptions throughout the building do so on a daily basis and with impunity. Some have been doing it for years. With these roving packs of students wandering the halls, occasionally being herded around by security or breaking into a room to attack another child, what we hear from administration is that they wouldn't be in the hallways if our lessons weren't boring. There's supposed to be a uniform policy. I suppose there is one on paper somewhere. Staff, staff gets more trouble from administration for trying to enforce it than students get for breaking it. When we bring data that suggests block scheduling is detrimental to our students, that it's devastating to a population with chronic absentee issues, the response by administration is that teachers can't teach the block. 
when every special education teacher I've ever spoken with says that we need more pullout programs that some students don't benefit from and some students do damage to the mainstream classroom, we hear from administration that teachers don't know how to differentiate properly. We've been told that, according to the data, there are less students wandering the hallways this year than there were last year. My eyes and those of my colleagues who are actually in the building last year suggest otherwise. Is there a reason that not one administrator who would have seen the same thing is still administrating at the pub? What are you trying to hide? There have been administrators in this district who have failed their way up to as high as assistant superintendent under the blind eyes of those at central office. Because of their silence, teachers now get reprimanded and reported to DCF for merely doing their jobs. We're all mandated reporters. DCF me and I'll DCF you. We can't differentiate away the myriad of bad policies that get thrown at us each school year, and they are bad. We're supposed to have the same goals. My goal is to educate children. Yours seems to be to have data that makes it look like you're educating children. These are not mutually exclusive. If your policies were good, the relationship you have with your teachers wouldn't feel so adversarial. I'm a teacher. What are you? Dose dice at the side. Hyacinth Yenny. Good evening, everyone. Superintendent. I know you're under a lot of pressure right now, to be honest. I'm going to be honest with you. We are in crisis in this system. And you know, all the good things that's been done is being blocked out by the negative things. So the good things are not being talked about. You know, the other day we had this great robotic team at Hoffer High. But all those are clouded by the negativity that's happening in our building. You know, we talked about everything, but no one talked about our parents. Our parents are taken out of the equators of teaching. I, I, I felt that when my kids were going to school, there was a partnership between myself and my teachers. That's all not there anymore. So now we are just teaching kids with no form of uh, parent involvement because it's not there, okay? I don't, who, I don't care who said they may be training parents. There's no training, okay? So I want to let you know that. My beloved classical magnet is at the bottom of the barrel, and it saddens me. I saved that program years ago, and it's going down the hell hole. All right? We have wonderful children. We have wonderful staff. But there's no discipline. And administration, hands are tied from really doing discipline. So, superintendent, I'm asking you. You need to know what's going on in this building. And the only way you can know if you are in those buildings, go in those buildings on a daily basis to see what's happening. Otherwise, you will hear these teachers. How do you have kids going to school six months, eight months, without a science teacher, and you expect to graduate them without an English teacher, and we expect to graduate those kids? Classical was one of the highest school in the city of Hartford, and now nobody wants to go there. No kids want to go there. It saddens me. I'm hoping that you can save the building, you can save the kids, you can save everything in this district, I'm telling you, it's a lot of work to do. But we need help. We are in a crisis, and there's no doubt about it. There's no pushing it under the barrel because it is there, it is there, and we need to do something about it, all right? So we need to get a parent involved, and I'm not sure how we're going to do that, because I think parents is kind of taking themselves out of being involved with what goes on in their children's life. Okay, so we need to make sure that we are getting them back, getting them back into the building to feel like they're a part of our building. Save our school, help us. Build a relationship with the teachers. The teachers are the ones that are on the front line at all times. Please help. Thank you. Nicole Salmario. Um, I 
apologize in advance. I didn't plan anything, and I'm trying my best to keep myself together right now. Um, I'm going to start with a, a, just an anecdote. My seventh graders have only three classes, and so about four hours of their day is random periods, intervention, advisory. So my team took it upon ourselves to, to plan elective classes, and the students got to choose. Um, 27 of a 71 class group of students chose to be in student council. So we started a seventh grade student council. And the first day we just um, established norms. And then I said, what do you want from our school? What do you want out of your school? What do you want out of the place that you come for seven hours and 15 minutes a day? And the three things that they chose to focus on first for the next two months of school were they want a health class they want a health class. They want to be kinder to each other. These are from their mouths, not teachers. They want their school to be a place where people are kind to each other. And they want to be able to paint and plant things and make their school beautiful. So if we want to talk about holding children accountable, we first need to talk about our accountability. And that starts with the district, and we all know that the budgetary constraints we work under don't allow us to have the staff that we need, <clears throat> excuse me, the programs our kids deserve, and those are not in our locus of control. Those are not right now in my locus of control. But the things that, our, that are in our locus of control as teachers, as staff members in the building, are doing our very best job. And quite frankly, I know I'm going to be crucified for this tomorrow, but I'm going to speak the truth. We're not, we are not, I'm sorry, in a 10-person middle school. We have two teachers currently not even in the building. So our kids are already down 20% of that staff. And quite frankly, when you ask kids why they're not in class, it's because teaching isn't happening and teachers aren't being held accountable. And I can say that as a teacher. That is my life every day. So when we talk about teachers who work hard, I put in often 14 hours a day because I love my kids, truly love my children. But that's just as, as angering to me as it should be to our kids and our families and our city and our board because I work hard and a lot of people don't. And why is that? Why is that? Superintendent, I'm sorry. I'm starting an 092 program this summer and I'm sure I'll never be actually an admin in this district because I talk too much, but what are we doing from the top down to hold those staff members accountable? And I'd like to say one last thing to the comments that have been made. There is no such thing as a bad student. I'm going to pronounce the last name incorrectly. I do apologize. Sasha Bentham. Sasha Bentham. Kelly Santana. That's a guts. I like that. Hi. <laughs> Good evening, board members, superintendent. Like to see you in that middle chair. Good job. Congratulations. My name is Kelly Santana. I'm a Parkville parent, a parent leader, NRZ member of the Parkville community. I'm on the board of directors of the NRZ. I have a vote. And uh, my question is basically to the teachers of why the vote of no confidence against our new park, uh, principal at Parkville. I'm wondering if uh, your vote of no confidence is based on the fact that she's a Latino and she's in a Latino community and she comes from that school. She's a product of that school. Because for six years there was no pushback 
year after year when there was evidence, real evidence of no leadership ability in that school. I wonder if the pushback you're giving her is based on the past because in the 16, 17 school year, only 24 kids could read at school level at Parkville. At the 17, 18 school year, only 17 kids could read at Park, at, at grade level at Parkville. So I'm wondering is, is the pushback against her, is it because she's gonna push you to do your job better? I would like to also point out that her work so far this year has surpassed the work left behind the old principal. Maybe the reason you vote no confidence on her is because she can see past all the BS reason you as teachers give for not doing your job well. Or maybe your vote of no confidence against her is because she supports the superintendent's plan of excellence. Let's not forget the biggest pushback came from the teachers against that idea. I get we need teachers. But what we don't need are any teachers that are in our district that are not here to better a Harford student. We do not need a teacher pushback on change that can better our students. And right now, more than ever, we need to stop making it about the teachers and keep the focus on the children. So we as parents, we as parents, at Parkville, we support the new principal. And I leave you with a vote of no confidence against the teachers of Parkville for not wanting to better my neighborhood school, for not giving their very best when it comes to teaching the kids at Parkville. And I'll leave you with this. We as parents need to really take a look at the teachers coming from outside of Hartford that don't look like the, two, the students they're teaching that need to be escorted to the parking lot at night because they're scared of the neighborhood that they're in. Are they here to teach our children? Are they here to help keep us, people of color, suppressed? Amen. Food for thought. Thank you. And I'll leave you with 10 seconds. Jesse Pierce. My name is Jesse Pierce. I sit here this afternoon and I listen to all the teachers rant and rage, and it kind of frustrates me. The fact that they don't know our kids. They don't know the black and brown kids. So they say they, they unruly, they don't this, they don't that. But each parent here that got a kid in the Harfest public school system, we live next door to the rapists. We live next door to the gun person that's toting the gun. So when my kid, our kids go to school, we don't have those outreach programs at school. Our neighbor just got killed. That kid go to school with attitude, you don't even know why. You don't even question the fact, is there something wrong? Can we help you? Could we do something for you? This is not normal for you at your age. Instead, you sit around here and you criticize our kids. We walking down the street and they walk to school a whole mile. You talking about why they late? Who would send their kid to school when it's three degrees outside and they got to walk a mile? Let's talk about being late. But back to our kids, you not, these teachers not knowing our children. They not knowing their they culture background and what we go through every day and our children. They not trying to understand our children. They get those big paychecks and they run back to the suburbs. How is that? They got a school, bo a school board for the teachers, the, the, their union, that they hide behind. Right. At Parkville, there's some racism going on there. I'm sure you guys heard about it. You're in the system so it done came past your desk. What are we going to do about things like that? You got teachers rebelling against the principal because she wants the best for our children. You got teachers that's telling me when I walk into school and I'm a part of the school, PTO and uh, other things there, I'm not good with all these words like these teachers are. 
didn't get a chance to get that kind of education when I was growing up. I'm 64 years old. It was deprived. Now here it is 2019, and our kids are getting deprived. In the next five to eight years, community college is going to be free in some form or fashion. My son will be out of high school in 10 years. He's not going to be able to take that test to go to school. What are we going to do about it, people? Are we going to listen to these teachers and cry and complain? Get some of our own color into these schools so they can teach these teachers. So they can show these teachers and tell them what goes on in the community. They can look at a child and say, something wrong with that child. Not judge him because he's got an attitude. They can look at that child because they're from that community and say, there's something going on in that home. Or there's something wrong with this child's heart or his mind instead of judging them. We need more of our own kind in our schools. And to teach these teachers that don't know. They've been in these classrooms for years. And our kids are not learning. And they talk about they got problems. We got problems. They're not learning. Our children. You got teachers been in school. I've been here 30 years. I've been here 40 years. What's your solution? What do you want? You want our kids to come to school and y'all carry guns in the school? You want our kids to be walked out of schools in handcuffs? What are you going to do? Anybody got a Mr. solution? Mr. Pierce, please address the board. Has anybody got a solution? Does anybody? I'm tired of hearing them talk about our kids. Half these teachers shouldn't even be teaching. Period. Period. We need to maintain order, please. Don't say that. Don't say that. You look just like Uncle Tom anyway, so be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. It's my turn. We need to maintain order, please. It's my time. It's my time. Shut up, Uncle Tom. It's my turn. It's my turn. That's, there you go. See there? If he's a teacher, that's what our kids go through. That's just what our kids go through, just like that. He jumped in a conversation he shouldn't have been in, and if I'm a kid at the school, I got upset. I called him something. Now I'm wrong. This is what goes on in the school. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Thank you. Uh, your time is up, sir. Mike Snow, please. We need to maintain order, please. Thank you. Mr. Santana, please. I'm sorry, you're going to get ghetto now because they want to sit over here and act like they're righteous because they got an education and they're the teacher. We are the parents of the teacher, okay? We're the parents of the children that you are talking to them. We're now to be upset. We break our necks and there's a lot of single parents. I was a parent at 14 years old. I had my first child when I was 14. I had a seventh grade education. <laughs> Come on, man. Y'all need to stop. That's why we ain't getting nowhere. That's why the world is doing that. Yeah. But we got very bad people against the Congress. Caucasian people need to go the fuck back to Caucasian town. Come on, JR. Mike Snow. Milagros Vega. I'm sorry. I'm a parent. I'm a grandma. Thank you for work for my grandchild and for my children. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm going to say. I'm coming here to speak Spanish and forgot about the Spanish speaking. Okay? Why? Because this is not right. Parents have right to speak when we're upset. 
Why the staff won? The board of education because he's a staff need to open his mouth when the parents speak. Right. If you get upset, get upset. Exactly. And what the security? Ms. Vega, please address the board. I'm sorry. They said I'm gonna address what happened here now. And the security right. take out the parent was speaking, and the one that start the problem stay here like nothing. Right. Okay. I must say, because if I neglect my grandchild, this year took her away. And what happened, that all these teachers neglect our children in education. They even don't, don't say not to read. And what's going to happen with them? Who's going to call this year on them? I'm really upset. Yes. If they don't know the score, I can show the score of every school I got it here. They, a lot of, um, with all the respect for the teacher, we only have few that come to Hartford Public School to teach our children. But the other one here is just for the money, especially the one that comes from outside. I'm really upset, okay? Because they always say that children that don't read at the third grade level, they're not gonna read. That's a liar. I know a child, now it's a man, that has a renta, mental retardation, a high level, okay? And he didn't read at the third level. But when he, he was in intermediate school, he found a student, a, a teacher, that teach him to read. You know what that means? That if the teacher come with a love, with her heart, to teach, not only for the money, our student wanted to learn. Amen. We need a real teacher. We need to evaluate this teacher that they say they've been for a lot of years and why our children is low. They complain about the student, the behavior, academic, <laughs> but if the teacher don't have no motivation, how do you think the student gonna have motivation? Exactly. We need to start for them. Get a motivation, get motivated to teach the student. Don't stay in the same line, do something different. I guess they try to make Thank you, God bless you, but we need to undo a different. Start getting off from this teacher. Whoever don't want to teach, go out. Right. Get a new teacher. Thank you, Ms. Vega. Thank you. Thank you. Alexis Colon. I'm a parent. Um, my daughter goes to Parkville. Um, I grew up in Parkville. I grew up going to Cormiddo, Hartford High. Like I've been all my school years in Hartford. And growing up, we did have a hard time with the reading levels. And I like the fact that my daughter's principal is more active with the kids. We see the changes that she's been doing. Um, growing up, my reading level always been low. I always been on the one of those students that had low reading scores and stuff. And I'm trying to make sure that my daughter don't go through what I did. I want to make sure that the school is becoming, um, with her being the principal, we've seen improvements. My daughter is looking to read, is looking active to, wants to learn how to read. And we want to um, improve the students. And a lot of the teachers in Parkville is not agreeing with that. They, they're not looking like putting the effort to help with the new changes that the principal is trying to bring in for these students. And so um, today's my first time speaking out, so I'm a little bit nervous. But um, yeah, we want Parkville to be able to accept the changes. And if the teachers don't agree, then we think we need to change the teachers. We need to actually have teachers that want to really help our students. 
because Harvard is a very multicultural school. We really want to help these students improve because there's a lot of students coming in being bilingual and they can't even sometimes have trouble even speaking. So we want that teachers really put more effort into wanting to help these students build their reading, learning to write, because at this point I'm in college. And I could say throughout my years in, in schools in Hartford, I still have a hard time having to write a research paper for my college. And, and that all begins from the back, not having my parent, my father was also a security in the Hartford schools for about 11 years. And growing up and having him bilingual, I depend, okay, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to learn from being in school. But it was hard not having like that really support of teachers trying to help you build your writing, how to read, and stuff like that. And to this day, I'm learning consequences, and I'm having to teach my daughter, like, no, you're in school, your teacher's going to help you, but I'm also going to help you. But we need to also start with the teachers, making sure that they're helping our students also. Yes. Yeah. Not collecting a picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Millie Arsenega. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Millie Arsenegas. I am the executive director of the Hartford Parent University. You know, it, what you see here tonight is change. But the change in mindset starts with oneself. And I know it's sometimes hard to do. But as I listen to teachers talk about our kids in a derogatory way, and not look at their own code of conduct, which there is a Connecticut code of professional responsibility that I think that they're ignoring. And by statute, if they violate this, they can lose their license. And what you hear tonight is frustrated parents that have been stepping up to the plate and getting on leadership roles. But the nonsense that goes on because of a person's color of skin, really? Did you know where you were teaching at? When you applied, did you know that you were coming into a high poverty, Latino, African American, immigrants, population. So for you as teachers to sit there and judge our kids when you should be teaching them, that's why you're a teacher. Understanding them like Jesse says. And maybe what we all need is a cultural competency training. Put that in the budget. Put that in the budget. But start with the teachers. Because if the teachers cannot understand our kids, then they don't need to work here. Okay? So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sean Robinson. Hello, I'm Sean Robinson. I'm a mother of five. Grew up in Hartford, went to Hartford Public Schools. <sighs> well, I wrote a speech for tonight, but I'm just really disgusted on how our kids were talked about. Um, I'm just, the charter schools are doing it. Maybe they should use best practices at these neighborhood schools or magnet schools because the charter schools are doing it and it doesn't seem like they're having these kind of issues. But 
I'm concerned about effective teaching. When I look at the test scores from our district community schools, our, our schools are so far behind, our kids are behind. If people with college degrees and teaching certificates are teaching our children, why aren't the kids learning? If you are the experts, they should be learning. There are schools with zero kids that are proficient in reading. And every time I review these charts, it gets worse. You all should be concerned. How will the kids become work-ready adults and leaders? S to me, scores should be based on pay. If I'm looking at these charts with these reading scores, and these kids, there's only 17 kids that can read in one school or none, then we need to revisit why they're teaching. Why are they here? Why are they asking for extra pay? Another thing is schools are not safe. When teachers are not reporting abuse and what's happening to children by their own colleagues and peers, we have a problem. You report on us parents, and that's why there isn't any parent engagement because the school is too busy acting like the police and reported parents to DCF left and right, but I've witnessed things in school that happened with staff with other teachers standing around and nobody's reported but myself. That's the problem. So I do encourage everybody to stay woke because these are our kids and I will be encouraging other families to look into what these teachers have said here tonight and I will be sharing it all over Facebook and Twitter because you will not come into my community and speak so poorly about our children. If you do not, if you have a problem and you're scared to be here, then you need to go where you live and teach and give our kids the seats that they're owed. Thank you. Naisha McCauley. Good evening, everyone. Um, I came here tonight to, uh, first let me just clarify, um, because I know many of you uh, personally and professionally, and many of you obviously are aware that I work for Chief Hartford. So I just wanted to be clear um, about who I was speaking for tonight. It is not a Chief Hartford, um, although what I'm speaking about um, is associated with a Chief Hartford, but just so we're clear, I'm not representing the organization. I personally am coming here tonight to talk about Weaver and the um, process that we were involved in around the new Weaver High School uh, that really was led by Blue Hill Civic Association. So of course, the Chief Hartford was a part of this, but many others were as well. What I wanted to talk about was this, this process that we have formed around Weaver High School, uh, which started about two years ago, where um, something unprecedented in Hartford, where we uh, came together as a real community and wrapped our arms around a new vision for Weaver High School. Parents, teachers, business leaders, community leaders, everyone, students, Everyone was at the table. We imagined and dreamed together of what a new weaver could be. Addressing many of the things that you're talking about tonight, you know, we did it as a community for that reason. Knowing and understanding our students, knowing and understanding the community, knowing and understanding one another. And it was the first time, I believe, anything like this has been done in Hartford where you had the full support and full buy-in and everyone was dreaming and imagining together of what could be possible for, for the city. Unfortunately, I think that, that dream never really had a chance to manifest because, um, for various reasons, but it's, so it's kind of a lament of what has happened. We, recommendations were put forward and 
there's this feeling as, as though these things are actually going to be implemented in, in the new Weaver, and that just, I haven't seen the evidence of it. So I'm, I'm here tonight to talk to the board members, and I'm just saying, you know, ask harder questions about what's happening at Weaver High School, because there was something special that was started, and it would be a shame to let all of the resources that was coming to Weaver to be squandered. And, and not just resources in name only, real resources. We were willing to come to the table with solutions, with funding, with everything. We thought through everything with those recommendations from beginning to end. It wasn't pie in the sky stuff of how are we gonna get this stuff implemented. It was real solutions backed with real dollars, commitment from real people who were willing to stay the course and see it through. So I'm just asking, ask hard questions about, and, and don't squander the opportunity and the spirit from all those people for two years who wrapped their arms around Thank her you, and McCoy, said, we are here for this school. Thank you. Raquel Calderon. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, good evening, Dr. Torres. And I'm really sad to see what's going on in here today. And this is, um, I am a substitute teacher, and I go every single school. And lately, I chose what I have to go, what I feel safer. I heard, I heard the testimony of some teachers, and they are one of the best teachers we have in, in Hartford. And I am glad they're here to share their comments, and it's absolutely the truth. I am a witness. I go there, and I don't use a card of color because I'm Hispanic or because my skin it's dark, I'm not gonna use that card. But children talks to me. And the reason, and the reason that they don't pay into you know, in school, they say they are forced to come to school, their parents send them to school, because if they don't send them to school, they go to jail. They don't wanna be in school. And they, many of them, they sleep in class, and they said that they couldn't sleep because there was too much noise in their house, and this and that. I don't blame the, the children. No, I'm not against them. No, it's not their fault. There's a lot of problems out there. But these teachers are excellent teachers, and I'm not gonna put them down because I witness what they do, what they suffering, Students, there's a lot of violence. Yes, they call it this year for everything because you, Dr. Torres, told us to do that after an hour. You told us that you said the procedures in there that we have to call and this and that. Nobody should be blamed for that. If you see that a kid is, this is happening, I wish I had more time to talk because I have a lot of things to say. It's not safe in the schools in Hanford anymore, and the teachers are getting sick, pension, the kids don't want to listen, they're fighting, they, they're hitting other children, and, and children, other ones are quitting because they say they don't want to be in a bullying environment. It's hostile environment right now, not by every children. Few, but those few keep us busy and you need to do something about it because there's no consequences because this is dr torres says oh no we have to we have to call her before we do something so the bottom line is no consequences right now and these teachers are really excellent and i don't want them discriminated because they have brown hair and they and they have a they, we all different colors, and it doesn't matter. Thank you, Ms. Calderon. Your time is up. Michael Down. My 
name is Michael Downs. I live at uh, 74 Rosemont Street in Hartford. Um, uh, evening board members and uh, superintendent. Um, I'd like to address first the appointment of Craig Stallings uh, to the, uh, the Hartford Building Committee, School Building Committee. Uh, I think it's a, a very good appointment. Um, he was an effective, uh, very effective uh, board chairman. And um, I also had a chance to work with him on several committees with the NAACP. And I've known him for over 30 years and uh, he's a very nice person, very good and very, uh, uh, he'll be he'll make a very good member of that uh, committee. Um, as far as uh, behavior goes, uh, uh, one thing I, I remember that we used to have uh, back uh, 30, 35 years ago was a very effective and strong inside suspension. Now, uh, the, um, that's one way to address the behavior. It's not the only way, it's not the only reason that the students misbehave. But uh, that, uh, there shouldn't be, the outside suspension should be rare. And, and you know, it costs money. You have to have a certified teacher and a paraprofessional teacher. You have to have male and female in the inside suspension room. And uh, the high schools have to have two or three inside suspension rooms. The uh, middle schools have one. Um, and uh, they could even, they, they, they have them in, they can have them in the uh, elementary schools. But they have to be strong. And, they, and you have to support them. And it costs money. Um, uh, the, uh, another reason, of course, students are uh, out of the classroom and, and maybe misbehaving is because uh, uh, we're not offering the courses, especially in the high schools, that we need. And uh, I'll address that at the, uh, in our budget hearing. Um, but the, the, uh, uh, it, it troubles me uh, as a uh, citizen of Hartford, North Hartford, uh, to see the, I see, uh, I know the teachers have a good argument, um, and uh, also the parents have a good argument. And uh, uh, somehow uh, we need teachers and we need parents and we need the students. So somehow we would have to come to a meeting of the minds. Thank you. Melissa Yenny. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, I've been in Hartford my entire life. Uh, I'm a proud graduate of Hartford Public Schools. I went to this very school, N.B. Fox. I remember my second grade play. My teacher is actually in the back. Um, Cork Middle School and Hartford Public High School. I'm also a proud daughter of an involved single mom, Kaya Sintiani, who's holding my son, who literally came with me to school every single day. She didn't miss a day. <laughs> Ask any of my teachers. She was there. I am also a very, 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 very proud Hartford Public School teacher. <laughs> and I am extremely, extremely involved in my community. I love my kids. I love this district. And I do my job with every being, every string, every DNA piece of thing in my body and soul. <laughs> I have a very unique perspective because I've seen this district from many different sides, not just the side of a teacher, not just the side of a student. I completely understand both sides that we have going on back here. But right now, we all need to find a way to come together. And when I say we all, I mean parents, Board of Education members, students, teachers, administrators, we need to come together because we're in crisis. I'm currently concerned with the state of education in this district. We're failing our students. We're failing our parents. We're failing our teachers. And we're failing our administrators. We are failing. And it hurts. It hurts to say that. As a teacher, one of the things I pride myself in in every school that I've worked in is my ability to build relationships with my students. So today I come here with statements from my students. One student said, as a student, I often find teachers stuck repeating the same thing over and over 
because several students believe it's appropriate to constantly interrupt the teacher. We find ourselves behind other classes, not understanding the curriculum, and frustrated because teachers are not allowed to teach due to classes co coerced by ill-mannered students and parents. This is from a student. Another one. Students being obnoxious do dis disrupt my learning because I'm someone who likes to take detailed notes, and when people won't stop talking, I can't hear the teacher to do that. I also, ask, I also ask a lot of questions, and sometimes the teacher can't hear me, and when people decide to go off, the teacher can't teach to get the point across. So with that being said, our students, our parents, as we can hear, our teachers, as we can hear, are crying out for help. This is our future. For the sake of my son, who's literally sleeping right there, who will be a Hartford Public School student, we live here. We're not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I have a moral obligation to this district. I'm not leaving, even though it's difficult. And the pay is not that great. <laughs> we need to come together for a brighter future. It's looking real gloomy. It's looking real sad. And I'm scared. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Natalie Lan Langlis or Lanaglis. I apologize. Oh, that's fine. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie Langlis. I've given myself a new title, Hartford Community Liaison. <laughs> Um, it's a real sad day for me because I echo the sentiments of both sides, of the parents and of the teachers. Um, I think that increased calls to parents during the school day for normative age-appropriate student developmental matters is tantamount to parent harassment. You're there to teach our children. And um, as a parent, I believe my responsibility is to provide you with a student that is ready and willing to learn. Um, a lot of times I say things that annoy my peers. But truly, us parents have to step up to the plate. We can't just put all the blame on the teachers. Okay, um, that being said, I think there's a need for employees in education to be informed and understand that you serve a high need community and you must be able to pinpoint differences, differences between a traumatic outburst of a child who has been exposed to socioeconomic disparities as compared to a regular child who might be goofing off a little, a little too bit, like my son, he was a little bit immature for his age. And then, um, you know, we have children who experience different um, levels of, of um, developmental issues. So, considering the whole gamut of things, it looks like we need a community forum, okay? Um, we have disgruntled parents, we have unhappy teachers, we have unsafe schools, and we are all not happy. So we need to do something about that. I'm always for collaboration. I also want to say that while they are good teachers, there are some rotten apples in the bunch. Okay? I have been exposed to some real harsh treatment by teachers. Real, real harsh treatment. I'm one of the parents who, who, who went to a teacher and said, hi, I would like to engage you about my son. And I was told, I am a lead parent in this district, and I was told by a teacher, I'm going to call DCF on you. Because I'm asking, how could we collaborate to make sure my son has a good year at school? Okay? So it's about three weeks now I pulled him out of half of public schools. And that hurts me. And I'm still here because I'm looking back for the other kids, okay? Um, in one month, in one month, Justin is telling me about the core of the earth, the mantle, and the crust. 
about land above water and oceanic land, about suburban rural and urban areas, about alliteration, about maths. He has a geometry set in one month. Ms. Langlois, your time is up. Thank you. In one month. We could do this. Our children could learn. We have to come together. Thank you, guys. And that concludes public comment. And we move on to the uh, agenda. Uh, Ms. Santiago, could you call the roll? Present. Present. Here. Present. Present. Here. Here. Thank you. Uh, we move on to the superintendent's report. I know this is not a regular meeting, and so my report is uh, actually very short. But I will start, given that we uh, have gotten into the practice of celebrating. Um, want to highlight our um, food and child nutrition services. I don't know if the team is here, um, but as you know, our food and nutrition services has taken major strides to provide healthy and often organic, locally grown and culturally relevant food offerings and meals served to uh, approximately 21,000 students each day at no charge to our students. And the department is also focused on promoting healthy eating by engaging our students. Uh, in addition to continuing to increase the culturally relevant foods, um, our director, Lonnie Burt, and her team are very committed to increasing local purchases and partnering with local businesses as often as possible. And um, they have a an outstanding uh, relationship with uh, Knox and uh, often buy fresh purchases from them. Uh, they were recently acknowledged for uh, their great work and received a, uh, an award, a government agency uh, award. And so I just wanted to acknowledge the team. Uh, they were also acknowledged um, in an official citation by um, our mayor in recognition of their uh, major strides in providing healthy, locally grown, and culturally relevant food offerings to all of our students. Um, and so they were honored at the annual Community Food Services Award. Uh, so congratulations to our team. Uh, a few updates. One is uh, relevant to the work that we continue to do in all of our schools with our data-wise continuous improvement process and uh, the second uh, series of learning sessions that took place for um, district teams and 40 school teams. And this focus was to uh, implement uh, the last uh, three steps of the process. And as you know, the teams have identified uh, areas, priority questions, and uh, learner-centered uh, processes and problems around improving literacy and our attendance. There was a uh, call to action, uh, an all call to shoulder up for our summer bridge programming. On March 27th, we hosted um, a learning session with our community partners on uh, summer programming. And um, we're grateful to the 55 partners that joined us at the all call. And it was an opportunity for me to share with our partners uh, data relevant to the transition from eighth grade to ninth grade, including uh, what we call early warning indicators, which um, uh, we're able to identify early on before students transition to, uh, to high school. And so we are now continuing those conversations. Uh, and one of those uh, next steps took place today where we, uh, in collaboration with um, our mayor and his, uh, Ms. Ms. Oliver, 
and her department um, welcomed uh, the Hartford Opportunity Youth Collaborative as well. And this is all part of the work that we are beginning to do to make sure that our students have opportunities in the summer so that they can be ready for ninth grade and then to ensure that they remain on track uh, in ninth grade so that they can um, be more successful in high school and when they enroll in um, post-secondary uh, programming that they are persist that they persist through those as well. Lastly, wanted to highlight um, with regard to transportation and uh, our transportation department and their efforts to improve operational effectiveness to better serve our families. Uh, the transportation department has been reviewing a variety of demos of school bus parent portal apps and the apps will provide uh, real-time bus arrival estimates for our parents and students. They also notify them if, if a bus, for example, is going to be late. Um, and uh, this is all done through uh, software and an and app. And so this is software that is uh, a requirement of the RFP for the new bus contract that is going to be in place this summer. And um, the goal for this is to be available for our parents and our students uh, next school year. And this is, again, in response to some of the feedback that we have gotten from, from our parents to improve uh, communication and, on, and timely communication as to our transportation. That will conclude uh, my report. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Uh, we have an administrative appointment, a uh, motion that the Board of Education approve with the superintendent's recommendation to appoint Glynis Jordan to the position of principal at Weaver High School. Madam Superintendent. Yes. I'm just going to look at my... Um... And I will ask... Um... Chief of Schools Avila and Ms. Jordan to uh, join us. And I'll just make a few um, comments. So Ms. Jordan um, is actually driven by um, her father's lack of educational access and opportunities. She is in her 24th year in education and currently serves as the Executive Director of Programs at uh, New Leaders, Inc which is a nationally recognized organization that, uh, in which she designs and provides professional development to school leaders and their teams in transformational leadership. This is uh, work that she does across, across the country. Throughout Ms. Jordan's journey, she has been an English teacher, a curriculum writer and developer, a program coordinator, a high school principal, and a cluster principal. As a new leaders uh, trained professional transformational principal, she has led three high schools, all of which were in the stage of school turnaround. Some of her accomplishments include uh, achieving double digit gains on status uh, achievement assessments within the first year of appointments, uh, attracting and uh, facilitating partnerships with organizations such as John Hopkins University, um, the Michelle Obama Foundation as part of the theme-based programming that she was able to implement. Um, she's also featured in the book, The Breakthrough Principles for Innovation in Operational Leadership that led to dramatic improvements in student achievement. Uh, she's been featured on um, several national organizations around uh, her work in leadership, uh, is, uh, has implemented um, a customized model of restorative practices which uh, has reduced serious disciplinary uh, infractions and mediated adult student conflicts. She's provided K-12 leadership and support to middle and elementary school principals uh, within high school feeder patterns. And she has served as a lead uh, facilitator with Unbound Ed, um, another uh, nationally recognized organization to lead uh, learning for school leaders across the country. Um, she um, has several other uh, certifications as well. She comes to us with a Bachelor's of Arts in English and Secondary Education, a Master's in Curriculum and Instruction and Assessment, and um, she has lived um, in the greater Hartford area for just a little over a year. Um, and so that is a brief uh, snapshot of uh, Miss Jordan. Um, I'll stop there.
sit back and speak. Do you have any comments, Ms. Alla? Well, I, good evening, everyone. Good evening, board members, Dr. Torres Rodriguez. Um, yeah, what I would say is that it is very clear that Ms. Jordan has a deep understanding of turnaround practices and has implemented them in a way that has impacted students and led to success. She truly understands the Hartford student. She understands what it takes to accelerate learning for all students. And at the heart of her soul is equity. And she lives and dreams and embeds that in everything that she does. Um, I personally have had the opportunity to see that in action. And um, I do really believe that she is a good fit for Hartford and for Weaver High School. Thank you. Any comments or questions from board members? Ms. Prouty. Good evening. Good evening. I graduated from Weaver. And I just would like for you to um, maybe share um, why you think you're good for Weaver High School. Well, my current understanding of Weaver, and admittedly I have a lot to learn, is this strong sense of community. Mm -hmm. And so part of the fit is related to turnaround work but more importantly, it's really how I was raised. So a little bit about me, my um, grandmother had my mother late at 44. My mother had me at 44. So my maternal grandmother was born in 1886. So this idea around equity and, and community and, and grassroots and being true to your community and being true to those whom you serve has been instilled in me from childhood. And so I liken that to what I believe is part of the Weaver spirit, which is um, a very much a, a spirit of pride, a spirit of community, uh, a spirit of, of shared ownership for, for Weaver, for the school. And really, I see Weaver as being more of a community school than perhaps a school in, in, in the sense of it. And so that's one of the reasons why but I think for me, it was really confirmed um, as I looked at the students' faces that served on the community panel. And as I began to share with them some of the practices that I have done, that I saw lights come up in their eyes. And I saw their posture change. And I have found that students are the best judges of character. And when I watched them, it, it, it kind of, you know, ignited a, a new fire in me to make sure that I do everything that is humanly possible to make sure that Weaver High School is the high performing learning community that it once was and that we all believe that it can be. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Ms. Oliver. Oh, Ms. Clark. Ms. So, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> Good evening. I'm also a Weaver High School graduate here, and um, we're looking at Weaver High School as kind of a flagship hybrid school in terms of like magnet and community school um, together or neighborhood school together. Do you have any initial impressions or specific ideas about how you would help to meld this unique school community of magnet neighborhood um, with the component and a long history, long standing history um, as Weaver High School being kind of like a standalone comprehensive high school? Uh, just wondering if you have any ideas on how to kind of look back at what the old Weaver was and move forward into this new flagship hybrid model for a high school. So to answer your question, it's a little bit of yes and no. So yes, I do have a strategy. So my strategy is um, using a very um, robust tool. Um, I'm going to diagnose the, the current state of, of the school across the four priority areas that um, is in our current model um, that we have with the whole student model. Secondly, I really want to dive deeper into the recommendations that have been made by the committee to learn more about what the committee is asking for at the same time, learning more of the historical context of Weaver, while at the same time being really focused on first hires around the school uh, leadership team. 
And so from the learnings of that, which includes um, a lot of listening, a lot of observations, a lot of engagement with multiple stakeholders, from that information, then come up with the plan. It's very easy for me to say, oh, we could possibly do X, Y, and Z, right? But will that really work for Weaver? And so I don't know that yet. Um, what I do know, though, is how to find out what will work for Weaver. And I, I can't do that by myself. I need to engage all of the stakeholders in that process. And then once we have all the information that we need, then convert that into a 30, 60, 90, 120 day plan that then becomes public. So not only um, do I intend to uh, publish the plan, but also engage in updates on how we're doing, um, the goals that we've met, um, what we haven't met and why, what we plan to do about it, and also um, engage the uh, stakeholders in any ideas so that we can meet our goals. Very strategic and thoughtful. Thank you so much for your response. You're quite welcome. Ms. Clark. Thank you. Um, so looking over your resume and just hearing the magnitude of what's going on within our community, Hartford is very, very unique where we're very passionate about our schools, our district, education, um, our children. Um, and so with your background with respect to serious, um, reducing serious disciplinary infractions, I would love to hear your approach with respect to restorative action, um, suspensions and um, outside suspensions or wherever um, on how you use the how excuse me how you reduce discipline disciplinary um, infractions yes yeah, so um, honestly I, I got involved in, in restorative practices not necessarily to be a national trainer or presenter on it I, I got involved with it because I simply got tired of suspending black and brown children and sending them to jail as a high school principal. That's why. And I said, there has to be a better way. And so through restorative practices, we were able to develop a model that um, in one school it was called the Student Accountability Center, in another school it was called like the AIM Center, but the concept is the same. And what it is, is a restorative approach to um, how we manage student behavior, and that's the term that I use. And um, in each case, there was a center where I just simply strategically reallocated the staff that I had, so that I had one um, administrator dedicated to that with a team of support individuals, so that when we were restored, that we were 80% proactive and 20% reactive. And so that really involved engaging the staff in a lot of professional development around, first of all, how we talk to children. And, and using restorative language. So instead of saying, um, you know, don't do this, let's just rephrase it into this is what we do. So um, instead of saying, don't make assumptions, seek to clarify. So we would change the language. And then through a whole model where we would provide students with um, different tools and strategies, because what I found is that oftentimes when students come from um, impoverished conditions or, or just any type of, of condition where they didn't have access to certain communi communication tools or the proper tools to engage that was simply a, 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 a task around how do we uh, work with our students in a dialogue in an exchange so that they can learn a better way to communicate and a better way to engage and so we had certain things in place that were alternatives to, sus to suspension um, one of my schools was in its own township we had partners partnerships with the fire department, partnerships with the mayor's office, partnerships with Walmart. And so it was very easy for us to call the parents and say, okay, here's the choice. You know, he can go home for two days with you, or he can spend two days with the firemen and wash fire trucks and kind of learn about life. And the parent, oh, we let him do that. So it was those types of things, right? Community service. So you have injured our community. So now how do you uh, repair that harm? We had different types of um, call them like work details where they could plant things or they could do a little bit of cafeteria. So there were different types of um, um, things in place for students, but most importantly, it was all about changing the mindset. So we had a motto um, at one school, excellence, uh, excellence from all, for all. It was changing the mindset. Once 
it, it really, the interesting thing is this, it wasn't hard to change the kids' minds. Their minds were really, they, they want to be successful. No student gets up in the morning and say, oh, I want to disrupt, oh, I want to do this. They wanted to be successful. Once they actually started believing that somebody believed in them, it became very easy. The bigger challenge were, was actually the, the adults. The students, it just went like wildfire. And so we changed the way the, the school looked. We just, it was a whole different rebranding, for lack of a better um, term. And we had a, um, a discipline policy because, you know, we, I, I do believe in shared accountability. And so there were non-negotiables. And as long as you didn't violate one of those non-negotiables, we, we, we were good. And it was clear. It was clear to staff. It was clear to students. Um, staff understood what the uh, uh, discipline step policy was. Everything ran on the system. And so when I inherited one school, the discipline infractions were 70, I think 72% of the students um, were suspended at 15, at the time it was 1511 when I got the, um, when I got the school, 1500, yeah, 1511. And by the end of that year, we had reduced suspensions all the way down to 70 seven percent and at the same time we jumped up to 1860. So it's really about mindset, really about approach and adjusting the model so that we um, were not punitive but we were restorative and even when we had to suspend students because we had to suspend, they knew it. They, when the conversation came they already knew it. They said, I know I'm going home. I know this is why. I know you got to do what you got to do. And, that, and, and I did. And I love you, but you know, I can't, you know, we can't do this here. And they, and they understood, you know. And in some cases, they could um, negotiate and, and restore and get some time back. But that's basically what, what we did. So for, for Weaver, what I would do is conceptually, we would have something similar. I just don't know what it would actually look like because I'm still learning about the school. Thank you for that response. I just have one more quick question. Yes, um, And with, with your wealth of experience mm -hmm. and um, just looking over your resume and some of the leadership roles that you have been doing and the wonderful opportunities that you've been afforded nationally, just curious, why principal? Why come, not, I'm not using the word come down, but mm -hmm. you have such a wealth of experience in consulting mm -hmm. and doing other work. Why come to be a principal? So the main reason is I miss the kids. And um, that's, the, that's the driving reason. Why Hartford is, when I looked at the vision around the whole student, that was something that attracted me. I've, I've, I've been blessed in, in my work that every year, pretty much, um, since I exited the principalship to go to what I do now, every year and every uh, district that I work with across the country, almost every district has offered me a job. And, and, and that's a blessing. I, I don't take that lightly. Um, however, when I looked at Hartford, something was a little bit different. Because now we're talking about equity. And now we're talking about closing the achievement gap between the haves and the have-nots. And now we have a superintendent that has a vision that is focused on making sure that every student graduates prepared to transform the world. And you're the board, so you have to be supporting that too. And so what attracted me to Hartford was really that vision. I believe in transformation. I believe in what the power in believing in students can translate into and can do for students. And when I saw what is happening at Hartford, though it's still underway, right? I've, I've sat in here all night, so I know we still have work to do, but it's underway. And I thought, what an opportunity if I could be a part of this work. And so that's what specifically attracted me to Hartford that didn't, other places just didn't, didn't have that. I wanna be somewhere where I can make an impact. I, I want to be in a school setting where the children can leave every day saying I was better because I came here today. Or when they graduate from school, they, you know, uh, as the kids say, hit me up on Facebook or hit me up on Instagram, and, and they're going over stories of what happened in school. Th those are the types of things that, that I want to do. I want to 
do my part to make sure that every student really leaves. So I want the vision to be real. So when people come to Weaver, I want them to look at the superintendent's vision and mission and say, here, they're not lying about it. This is really what is happening. And because I believe in that vision and I believe in the work of this board, that's what made me say, okay, this is where I believe um, I can I, I, I can serve and I can help be a part of something great and something transformative. Thank you so much. I thank you for your in-depth uh, comments. And I don't really want to put you on the spot, but <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, you said one thing mm -hmm. that raised questions for me. You said that the challenge were the adults. Mm -hmm. And you sat through our public comments and saw a very lively exchange of thoughts and indeed at times behavior that was less than civil. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I wonder how you see this challenge here mm -hmm. as to mending uh, the relationships and the partnership mm -hmm. between the staff and, and the parents. Yeah. Um, the bigger the challenge, the bigger the opportunity. And, and that's really how, how I look at it. It, it was a challenge, it, it was a welcome challenge, and, and it was a challenge that made me a better principal as well as made a lot of teachers better teachers. And, and so once we get the staff uh, identified, and, and there's some things that you know I kind of have in mind, again, I can't be sure of anything until I get all of the information that I need. Um, but that's something that is a, a realistic um, challenge that, that would present itself. And, but what I found is that just through some very strategic moves that um, we can really work together to transform minds. And in the transformation of minds, um, by default comes the transformation of practice. And when we get a transformation of practice, we get a transformation of outcomes for students. And that's really what I'm about. So when I say like a learner-centered environment or a learning community, I'm talking about adults and students. We, myself too, we're all learning. We're all getting better. We're, we're all growing. And so through uh, an approach that is a balance of pressure and support, um, I believe very strongly in, in, in supporting staff. Um, I, I do a lot of work with professional learning with staff. I, I believe in building the capacity of staff. I also believe that students deserve the absolute best. And I believe that that's what every parent sends us every day is their best and that we have to give it our best. And I'm in it to help teachers to do that. And um, you know, if, if that can't happen, then there are other conversations that, that we can have. So I, I see it as a challenge, but it, it, it's a welcome challenge because sometimes Sometimes it's just about providing a different perspective. I've worked with teachers who said some of the same comments that I've heard here tonight. And then to watch their perspective change from the inside out, I mean, there's no paycheck big enough for that. I mean, when that moment happens, then you know that you have just changed a child's life. So challenge, yeah, but I've never turned down from challenges, and I don't expect to do that now, sir. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Ms. Oliver. Uh, so I had the privilege of having a nice conversation yeah. with you in depth. So I really didn't have a question, which is one of the reasons I wanted to allow my colleagues to uh, go before me. Um, as I shared, I too is a Weaver alum. Weaver was home. Mm -hmm. And for many of us, we feel like we lost our home. And so we're looking to you to rebuild it. I look forward to working with you and partnering with you. Um, and thank you for embracing community because it's about time we take this journey together. So thank you very much. And uh, I will be um, voting to approve this appointment. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you all. Thank, thank you all for your questions. Thank you for your um, concerns. Thank you for really being advocates um, for the community and so we are going to work together. I don't have all of the answers but I know this that um, all of the answers are generally in the room and together we, we can work it out and together we will work it out for our community and our students. Thank you. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the appointment of Ms. Jordan? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
All those opposed? Then it is approved. The ayes have it. If there's anything more you'd like to say, you have the opportunity to do that. You don't have to. Well, I'm a little emotional now. <laughs> yeah, I just, um, Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. I, um, I just, I, I really believe in children and, um, I've just always felt like I've just been called to, especially black, black and brown children, and making sure that they have the same options and the same access points as their white peers. And so I am so honored to lead. What, what, what I understand about Weaver is such an honor. So I can. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Thank you. Congratulations. Let's go. Next item 4.2, we have uh, the second reading and adoption of policy number 5124, confidentiality and ex access to education records. And the recommended action is that the Hartford Board of Education accept the second reading, adopt policy 5124, confidentiality and access to education records. Uh, any comments from members of the policy committee? Um, so, yes, so this policy is really coming forward as a second reading adoption. Um, think of this as more of us trying to get in line with our accountability around our policies, making sure that we're in compliance with um, state statute, uh, cleaned up a, a number of really like formatting and numbering within the policy, um, some specific language around who a school official is, like specifically outlining that, an update to include uh, modern methods of recording <laughs> school records, such as electronic messaging, um, messaging, videos, audio, and also mobile applications, so just keeping our policy in line with the times. And also, um, as I said, just satisfying the statutory compliance and referencing things from internet to a website where our policies now live for the posting. So uh, this is really trying to help policy committees stay in line with compliance and accountability and adhere to statutory regulations. So. We'd be most gracious on policy committee if folks would approve this for a second read and adoption. Any questions? So do I hear a motion to approve uh, the policy number 5124? So moved. Second? Oh, should I do that? Second. <laughs> then moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The uh, motion passes. It has been approved. Uh, next, we have a resolution appointment of school building committee member. Uh, and to admit, this is actually a correction. We were working on committee appointments pretty much till the last minute for the last board meeting. And uh, there was an error in the way the resolution was worded the last time, so this is to correct that. Mr. Craig Stallings will continue to serve on the uh, school building committee, and Ms. Oliver will step down. Uh, is there a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? I abstain. Okay, one abstention. The ayes have it. Motion passes. The resolution passes. Uh, item 4.4 .4. Contract Amendment Approval, Hartford Graduate School of Education. That the Hartford Board of Education authorized the superintendent to amend the contract with. Harvard Graduate School of Education for an additional $58,950 for 10 additional data-wise coach certifications for an extended term ending June 30th, 2020. Madam Superintendent. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Flores. This is part of the work that we uh, presented when you first approved the first contract. 
Um, we had not gotten the uh, cost of it at that point. This is, uh, just want to make a correction, this is not for 10 additional, These, this is for just 10, the first 10 uh, coach certifications uh, that will um, allow 10 of our staff members to become certified coaches so that we can then turn key the training and be certified to support uh, school teams throughout uh, the district. The work, uh, as you know, aligns with uh, district priority of teaching and learning and our goals of increasing uh, literacy, uh, graduation, and improving our uh, attendance. This is work that will require for these, uh, the group of 10 to engage in learning throughout the entire year, uh, taught directly uh, by uh, the folks and the experts at Harvard. Uh, there will be support um, that is in the form of web-based learning and on-demand on coaching. And our uh, 10, the 10 uh, coaches would also be required to demonstrate proficiency in all of the uh, competencies of the DataWise uh, coaching certification process. Uh, one thing that I would like to add, uh, given that this is an investment that we are going to be making, um, we, we are going to be requiring um, a uh, we're going to have a stipulation, if you will, so that the 10 that we identify um, have to remain in our district for a certain amount of time thereafter. Uh, and if um, they do, any one of them decides to leave um, us, they will be required to uh, pay the district for the investment that was initially uh, made. And so we will be working that out with our uh, talent management um, office. Any questions from the board members? Uh, yes, Ms. Falk. Um, just one quick question. Is the data that they're collecting, and I, I cannot remember, um, I do believe we talked about it, is it ours or is it going to be with Harvard? It is, it is our data. Um, what we are doing with Harvard as part of the entire, not just this, uh, uh, you know, not just this for the coaches, but the entire uh, learning experience is that um, Harvard is um, going to be doing research um, with us in terms of the implementation of this uh, continuous improvement process systemically. As you all know, this is something that we're doing with all of our schools and also at the district level. And so that's a different kind of data that they're going to collect in terms of implementation data. But in terms of the improvement and the outcomes that we're going to monitor as our teachers, our school teams, and our central office teams learn, it is data, our data around literacy uh, and, and attendance and graduation. But we will own that data. Okay, thank you. And then, um, sorry, I said one quick one, but actually one other one. The sustainability of this after um, with like the updates or anything like that, are they kind of guaranteeing that they will provide some sort of, like if any updates or anything happens, that we'll be able to have that versus contracting them out again? So this is why we want to do this work um, when we, um, first presented the first contract that was year one. We still have another um, contract that we are going to be negotiating with Harvard for year two for the current teams, all the 40, you know, 40 school teams and the central office team. That's year two of that work. But this will allow us to not have that reliance um, on Harvard past year two. So we will have 10 experts that are certified uh, in our district to do the work and to train others. Thank you. And I uh, have a question for clarification. Uh, you said that we would require them to pay back the cost if they leave within a certain amount of time. And I assume the reason for this is that this is an additional certification that will make them more marketable. Absolutely. Um, and, and this is a very differentiated way of achieving the certification. Normally, um, so I am a certified coach. I happen to be the only one in this state that is a certified um, person in this um, model. And um, it, it is uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, an incentive, if you will. Um, and it is uh, looked upon as um, an added bonus when you have someone that is uh, trained 
uh, not only in the model, which is what currently is happening, but to teach others in the model. Thank you. Any other questions? I'd like to uh, restate the uh, recommended action based on the superintendent's uh, correction. The recommended action is that the Hartford Board of Education authorize the superintendent to amend the contract with Hartford, Harvard Graduate School of Education for 10 uh, database code certifications for an extended term ending June 30th, 2020. So we're striking out uh, the words additional. Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion passes. And now we move to the public comment on the budget, item 5.1. Chairman. Uh, yes, Ms. Robbie. In, in regards to the vote that was taken um, for the appointment of the um, school building committee, I think, I don't think it passed. Karen. I don't know, is it appropriate for me or you? No. So on that vote, you had three yes, two abstain. So that's three that doesn't pass because it was not four out of seven. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is our attorney here? Well, did, did you? Did you have the votes on the computer? What? Oh, because Karen wasn't here. Oh, I oh see. you have stepped I'm out of the room. I am I abstaining from the vote. No, you were. I wasn't here, but I will abstain. From oh, okay. The vote. So, yes. So while we are researching that, we'll move on to the public comment on the budget. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over the ground rules uh, for the meeting. There's a public hearing on the superintendent's recommended budget. All public comments should be related to the budget. Any other public comments should be kept until the end of the regular board meeting, until the next regular board meeting. Each member of the public wishing to speak may address the board for a total of three minutes. At the two minutes mark, Ms. Santiago will ring the bell, letting you know that you have one minute to wrap up. At the sound of the second bell, your three minutes are up. We have uh, a lot of speakers tonight. Please be respectful of others' time. If you run out of time, you may submit your comments in writing to Ms. Santiago. No boisterous conduct shall be permitted. Time limits will be strictly enforced. No personal attacks on individuals. No vulgar or indecent language. No signs allowed inside the board meeting room. Speakers may not yield their time to another speaker. A speaker must refrain from naming employees. A speaker may address the board no more than twice during a single meeting. This is a difficult budget season and we encourage your input, but please be respectful. And now I will read it in Spanish. Antes de comenzar, queremos establecer las reglas para esta reunión. Esta es una audiencia pública del presupuesto recomendado por la superintendente. Todos los comentarios de hoy deben estar relacionados a este presupuesto. Cualquier otro comentario debe esperar hasta la próxima reunión regular de la Junta. Cada miembro del público que quiera hablar puede dirigirse a la Junta por un total de tres minutos. Al final de dos minutos, la señorita Santiago sonará el timbre para dejarle saber que le queda un minuto. Cuando suene el timbre por segunda ocasión, significa que se acabaron sus tres minutos. Tenemos muchas personas que quieren hablar esta noche, así que por favor seamos respetuosos del tiempo de los demás. Si no le da el tiempo, puede entregar sus comentarios por escrito. No se permite conducta ruidosa. El tiempo límite será aplicado estrictamente. No se permiten ataques personales contra individuos. No se permite el lenguaje vulgar o soez. No se permiten letreros dentro del salón de la reunión de la Junta. Una persona no puede cederle su tiempo disponible a otra persona. 
no se deben mencionar empleados por nombre. Una persona no puede dirigirse a la Junta en más de dos ocasiones durante una misma reunión. Este es un periodo de presupuesto difícil y queremos escuchar sus observaciones, pero por favor mantengamos el respeto. Gracias. Ms. Clark. Millie Osonega. Hyacin Yenny. Tiffany Moyer Washington. Okay, um, so I looked through the budgets, and uh, you know I'm a teacher, I'm an English teacher. My wife does my budget at home, so I don't know much about that. Um, my question was though, on one page it said net position changes, and it said there'd be 11 behavior specialists for the district. And then when I looked through the following 24 pages, there's no behavior specialists indicated for any of the schools. So I guess my question is, according to that budget, um, will the board superintendent allocate those behavior specialists as needed throughout the, like the schools didn't budget for them individually, but those positions are listed on that net change. So are those um, board positions that will be reallocated to the schools? Um, I guess that's a clarifying question. And the other question, I know it's not, it's sort of budget adjacent. Can we get Ms. Jordan to run professional development for the staff about restorative approach? Because it seems like we have an expert in the district. Um, so that's just my question about the um, behavioral specialists and who would allocate them according to the budget. Yes. So I know we're not supposed to engage no. in the answer. However, <laughs> um, our staff is here and we'll definitely have an answer okay. for you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Michael Downs. Good evening, board members. Uh, Michael Downs, 74 Rosemont Street in Hartford. Um, I've been uh, uh, tied up uh, the past couple of weeks with some family matters, but uh, I, uh, I read this morning's paper, the mayor's uh, proposed budget and I think it only had about 284 million or something uh, that for uh, education. And I thought we had, our budget last year was close to 300 million. Uh, I could be mistaken. But um, be that as it may, uh, once we decide on a budget, we should all stick together when we get on the city council to uh, uh, their hearing on it. Um, but uh, I, I, I'll tell you uh, that what is going to be coming up in the next mayoral election uh, concerning the budget and getting state money restored that was taken away. Because when I asked about where's the money and where'd the money go when all these cuts were made uh, in vocational technical education, family consumer science, culinary, um, uh, the uh, guidance counselors, uh, physical education, art, music, librarians, special ed, social workers, psychologists, um, preschool. I mean, we should, we still need uh, all day preschool free for our, all of our preschool students in the city of Hartford. Um, uh, instead of making the classes larger, we should make them smaller, and uh, and stop stuffing them in the in the one school. Or, and stuff them in the classrooms. Um, we're listening to members of the state legislature who want to deny us money uh, by closing our schools and, and uh, taking away our programs. And these programs, this will be, this will be coming up, but the, uh, I'm looking for a, 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 an avenue to the state legislature to report these, these uh, items that are missing in the city of Hartford and th these are budgetary matters, and they're going to cost money, obviously. Vocational technical education costs money. But it's money spent in every other district in the state of Connecticut except Hartford. So uh, I, I think, uh, uh, again, uh, I'll just close by saying uh, once we, uh, you know, we should together try and push for some of these things. It's a shame that we have some beautiful libraries with no librarian and they're not used by the students. 
Um, so I, 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 I will close by, uh, by saying that we have to stop cheating Hartford students and we're cheating the, actually the people of Hartford uh, by not offering these programs. And uh, that's one of the reasons high school students especially are not going to class uh, uh, and students are misbehaving. It's not the only reason, but that's one of the reasons. And we have to make uh, school interesting for all students, not just students that are uh, going to college. English and math are very, uh, uh, very important for all students, but we need these other programs too. And, uh, but we need to go to the council together once we get this together and, um, and fight for our students. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Downs. Amelda Barges. Well, that concludes the public comment on the budget. Several of our signed up speakers left before it was their turn to speak. Uh, Ms. Santiago. So the motion passes, and thank you. Can you repeat that? So uh, the, the five people, there is a majority of the board members that are present at the moment. Okay. And also something about the extension, not extending, but it is still the majority of the board members are present as long as we have to. Thank you, Miss Santiago. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. We are adjourned. Aye.